top of the time. This is tea time. Making a difference. One cup at a time. So be sure to grab your tea, grab a seat, and tune in to Miss Liz. Tea time. Making a difference. One cup at a time. Well, welcome to Tea Time. That's right, Miss Liz is back, and you know what time it is. It is time to spill a real-life tea with some stories and some incredible books. And today, I have two guests in the house. So I have co-authors of The Invented Detective. If you haven't heard about the book, you want to really go and check that out. So we'll be talking about that today. It's a futuristic mystery crime uh, and I, when I did my homework, it was a CD that I found. So we're going to be talking about that uh, on from Amazon and all of those incredible bookstores and all that. But before we get started, we're going to do disclaimer, bios, all that good stuff. And before we get even that started, we're going to get you over to Miss Liz's YouTube channel. We're going to get you to ring that little doorbell so you can be notified when all these incredible tea times go live. And you can watch them at, at home, in your car, at an event, whenever you feel like you just need a little picker up or Miss Liz has over 300 interviews that you can check out all walks of life on there. So if one topic doesn't resonate, you can get on to the other one. So Miss Liz gives you all different types of teas that we can serve with different flavors and blends. So the disclaimer for Miss Liz's Tea Time Live show, Miss Liz myself is going live using StreamYard. Before leaving a comment, please grant StreamYard permission to see your name at StreamYard.com. Please be advised that the content brought forward for any Tea Time show hosted by myself, Miss Liz, is always brought forward in good faith. However, may bring forward dialogues and opinions that are not representative of my platform. The facts and information are perceived to be accurate at the giving time of airing. All tea time guests and audience participants are responsible for using their good judgment and taking any action that may relate to the discussion. The content brought forward may include discussions for some where they may be emotionally at risk. It's significant to know that this show is engaging in discussion forums only to offer and inspire awareness and connection and is not providing therapeutical advice. If you have any questions about the disclaimer or the panelist discussion, you may freely contact me, Miss Liz, through my email at booking Miss Liz bookingmissliz at gmail.com. Moving forward, should you choose to voluntarily participate in today's show in any aspect, I myself, Miss Liz, welcomes you. And should you find that the show is not made for you at this time, I respect those wishes and we'll see you at a later show at a later date time. And again, all tea time shows are hosted on Thursdays, 3 and 7 p.m. Eastern Center Time. If you see a tea time on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, it's a surprise, rescheduled, or a special tea time that has come to the table that Miss Liz feels that needs to be out there for all of you guys. So now a little bit about my guests. Well, as you can see, I have Kat Ramble and I have Jennifer Bro Bro Brozik. I hope I'm saying it right. Uh, so they're waiting in the back of the studio and we're gonna get them in here to sp spill a different type of tea with you today. So Kat's gonna be spilling Trump, 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 Trump Wolves. I'm not saying it right. I'm going to get her to say it. I just asked her how to say it. it excellence and adapting. And Jennifer is going to be sharing her tea and it's techno technological, technical, technological, emotional, and ambitious. And we're going to spill it uh, together. So a little bit about who Kat is. Kat is a perfect, pro, prophylactic author and a new, new bollock award winner with over 250 published work. Jennifer is an award-winning author, editor, and a media media tie-in writer. And to get full their full bios, you can check out Miss Liz's Facebook page and LinkedIn page, and you can get your full bios there. Um, so let me get Jennifer in here, and let me get Kat in here, and let's spill some tea all together. Welcome, ladies. Hello. Hello. So, ladies, I'm going to start with Jen since she's on the top. Uh, so, Jen, who were you as a little girl and who are you now as a grown woman? Um, as a little girl, and by the way, this for those of you watching, this is Lilu. She is my littlest diva, um, and she will show in and, and out. Who was I as a little girl? I was a military brat who traveled around the world with her, fa her family. Um, who experienced a lot that it's only in retrospect that I can really appreciate. 
uh, who am I now? I am a woman living the exact life that I've always wanted to live. Uh, I am busy. I am, uh, I'm enjoying the work that I do as an author, editor, and media tie-in writer. And I, I appreciate the fact that, you know, there are people out there who, who like my work. And Kat, same question for you. Who were you as a little girl and who are you now as a grown woman? Oh, I was, I was a little, little kid with a Coke bottle glasses and a book in my hand all the time. Uh, I was a little bit like Harriet the Spy. I liked to watch, uh, did not really participate. Um, and nowadays, oh gosh, I, I actually, it, recently it is like Jen, it's sort of hashtag best life. Uh, I moved to Indiana a couple of years ago to the area that I grew up in. Um, I run a writing school where uh, last year we got to spend a month in Spain for that. And uh, this year going to New Mexico. Uh, I have amazing friends. I just got back from Gen Con where I got to see Jen among with uh, some <laughs> other people. And uh, yeah, I, I'm just, yeah, really having a good time right now. Well, and that's what I like to hear from both of you ladies, right? That you guys are just in, in, in your comfort zones and you're enjoying life and you're happy with what you're doing. Uh, I want to get into the science fiction because you're both science fiction writers. I've done a lot of work and you guys got amazing books out there. Uh, I checked out some of those books as well, but today we're here because you co-authored a book together called the reinvented detective. So what got both of you guys into science fiction? Well, we have to do one slight, it, we didn't co-author, we co-edited oh, an okay. anthology. So we brought together, I believe it was 20? 21, um, I think. 21 amazing authors who wrote to a theme that we brought together. Kat's the one who invented the reinvented series because this is not the first in the, the, the anthology series. I was the one who came up with the theme of detective. The first one was heart. The second one is detective. So, yeah. Uh, and, and we both, I think we both love science fiction and fantasy because we know that the writing is capable of so much more than just sort of like escapism. It's capable of a very kind of profound social commentary of kind of like deep empathy of, of you know, characters that you love. And uh, one of the kind of joys of putting the book together was getting to see what a variety of people did with the same theme. It was, yeah, it was really neat. So you gave a team a, a theme and a, a bunch of different co-authors wrote how they felt about that topic or? Well, no, it was, we had said, take a detective story oh. and put it in the future. And so that's where it's, it's the reinvented detective. It's the detective stuff as it could happen, maybe 10 years down the line, some people 20 years down the line, some of them, you know, in a galaxy far, far away. Uh, so like all sorts of, of really cool stuff. And the uh, um, protagonists were just varied. There's like a, a, a intelligent uh, cat. There's artificial intelligences. There's uplifted brains. It's just, it was just a blast to see what people did with those. Yeah. Wow. And from what I can tell, it's a futuristic book on crime, correct? Mm -hmm. yes. yes. How does the, the concept of justice and crime change in the future along with technology? What is considered a crime? If, if your digital persona is murdered, is that a crime? Yeah. yeah. Even if you, the physical body was still alive, uh, what happens to uh, how technology, Marie Bilodeau wrote a beautiful story about nanites um, that were used to help uh, dementia, but through flaws and bugs in the, the system, um, she was able to use them to bring the dead back to life just long enough to, if they witnessed their murderer, they would, they would be able to identify them and then the nanites would come back to her. Uh, it was it was a lovely story. It was a little creepy, 
Yeah, a lot of the stories were a little creepy. I mean, I, I think that's, that's one of the things funny. science fiction does well is is creepiness. So. Well, C.C. Fenley wrote, uh, uh, oh my God, the, the concept of needing money to buy justice. And to the title, have to well, go ahead. The title, wasn't the title, like the best justice money can buy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was actually named as one of the best um, mystery stories for 2023. Uh, yes. And it was all about the concept of if you were a victim of a crime, if you wanted that crime persecuted, you had to pay for it, or someone had to pay for it, pay for the the proceedings. And then how did a detective who literally got into the business because she wanted to help people use the system to pay for solving crimes that don't have basically a sponsor is I guess the best way I can think of it. So in this book, The Reinvented Detective, how many stories are in the book again? 20, well, no, there's uh, 18 and three poems. So what story stood out to you guys the most? I was just, I was just doing an interview the other day and I was reminded of one of the stories that is, it's a bit of a downer of a story towards the end, but it's called to, to each their own body to every, to each their own oh. body. Is that the title? It's by Guan, Guan Yun. And it's got this fabulous kind of a uh, far future generation ship. Uh, sort of feel to it um, and it is just beautifully done it, it just it, it sort of creeps up on you in, in a really nice way Jen what was what's your favorite um, because because this was something we've done uh, so long ago and I've written a novel and done two other anthologies since then I'm, I'm doing a quick look up to I think One of my favorite was actually uh, Coded Out, oh, which yeah. is, a, again, it's kind of a downer of a story. Um, and it's about, it was written by Frog and uh, Esther Jones. Uh, and it's about a detective who solves a crime of overdoses through the internet, um, but she pays quite the price to get that information out to the world yeah. uh, and it, it and it deals with the the way corporations are able to su subvert the systems of justice yeah i really i didn't that was one that has stuck with me um another one that has stuck with me is peter klein's the unassembled victims uh it is a enhanced I don't know, Android, cybernetic. Android, yeah. Uh, Android. Uh, there are a number of people of his uh, species are being murdered, but because they're considered a lesser people, they're not actually really investigating it. But And he is, as a, as a cop, uh, points out that this is, well. Not right. Not right. And But it finds out it's actually... The people being murdered are actually human, yes. but being made to look to be yeah. uh, the the unassembled. And well, in, unless the listeners think that every story is a huge deal. True, true. I yes. would like to point to uh, Rosemary Claire Smith murder at the Westminster Dino Show, where it's like the Westminster Dog Show, but there's these tiny modified dinosaurs that are intelligent. I mean, I want one of these dinosaurs so desperately, uh, but the protagonist has this little tiny dinosaur named Timidity Rex, and she's a tiny Tyrannosaurus Rex, and she speaks in sign language, and it's just like, oh my God, I want the dinosaur. Yeah. Well, there's also a, a Agent's Provocure by uh, uh, Lazarus Black, and it's about um, AI getting achievements in life, basically. And those achievements can be fixing, helping your, your person, your, if they're an assistant, helping the person you're assisting 
get a new love life or to get a a, a crime fighting badge or yeah. Uh, yeah. succeeding on all these achievements you know if when you play a video game you're like achievement unlocked or cheat you know uh, it's almost like something. it's almost like shopping on team, team boom right oh <laughs> yeah it's a little bit it, yeah. it's like feed yeah. the fish now and everything like yeah. yesterday i had to feed my fish to get my free <laughs> gift and i was like really like this is like a video game now so they're, they're not all downers but i mean it is a crime story and some of them are very poignant yeah. and some of them are are really thoughtful and some are down they, they are crime and some are sarcastic and then some are really just like Rosemary's story. They're yeah. really sweet. Uh, so you've got a little bit of everything in the reinvented anthology yeah. series. Yeah. yeah. So and she's doing, you... she's doing ahead, more of the dinosaur stories. Like I know she, she did when I, I was with her uh, at one point, she wrote a, uh, another one called like, a, it's like murder at the castle something or other and i think she's working on a third one so i'm hoping for like a whole book of <laughs> humidity rex stories so how long did this book take to put together about 12 months yeah i mean we, we because it was a semi-open call which meant we went and talked to a number of authors and solicited stories from them and then we had an open call and then that meant we had to read through all the stories and yeah. then choose our, our favorite. And, and then it was like Thunderdome, six stories go in, three go out. <laughs> so, uh, and then of course, publishing in general, when you're doing, especially traditional publishing takes a long time because there are a, a series of processes and to get them into the bookstores, they, the bookstores need to have everything four to six months in advance. And, yeah. uh, you know, for authors and editors, we we do the thing and then we move on. And yeah. by the time it comes out, you're like, oh, well, that was two books ago, or that was four stories and an anthology ago. I uh, okay, let's let's go back. A and lifetime ago, I'm a new person now. No, actually, actually, I'm still the much the same person <laughs> as when we started editing this. But yeah, yeah, because you guys have quite a few books out there. Because I did my research and, and I only got I put five books for each of you guys. And I was just like, whoa, there's so many more. And I was like, <laughs> like, wow. So I'm just going to put a couple of them out there that Kat has written and Jennifer has written. So if you want to check those out as well. Uh, for Kat, a rumor has it, you sexy thing, Devil's Gun, Altered America and Near and Far. Yep. Uh, were the ones that I put out because I just kind of liked the names and they kind of just popped out to me. Uh, for Jennifer, she's got Shadow Run, the Mosaic Run, Battle mm -hmm. Tech, Iron Dawn through co through Comedy Trilogy, Shadow Run, a Kiss to Form, a Shadow Run novella, Battle okay. Tech, the Nell Us Academy incident, and Shadow Run. Elf, Elf, Elfin Black. So there's a lot of cool ones. And what I really liked about, and I checked out the covers of all these books and I was just like, wow, right? They really take you on a journey, like each book. And you have so many out there. So what was like your most important, not, not important, but the book that stood out the most that you've written so far? Uh, let's start with you, Kat, and then I'll go to Jennifer. Sure. Uh, for me, the book that really uh, stood out was the first book in my space opera series, uh, You Sexy Thing. And You Sexy Thing is the name of the intelligent spaceship uh, that they steal that doesn't think it wants to be stolen. And that's, in fact, uh, rumor has it that's coming out next month is the third book in that series. Oh, wow. And Jennifer, which book stood out for you so far? So the book that turned my career up a notch was called Never Let Me Sleep. Oh. It's part of the Melissa Allen Never Never Let Me Sleep, Never Let Me Leave, Never Let Me Die trilogy. It's a sci-fi young adult thriller. And I had thought, what if Stephen King had written for teenagers back in the day? I want to read that book. So I wrote it. I wrote it in 13 days. And it was my first Bram Stoker nominated work. Uh, and it was the first thing that I very specifically just said, I'm going to write what I want to read. 
And ever since then, that is what I have been doing. I have been writing what I want to read. I have not been chasing markets. I have, even with the tie-in fiction, which basically means I, I uh, write in somebody else's world, I still write what I want to read. The Shadowrun and Battletech are, own, are gaming uh, intellectual properties, IPs. Uh, and Shadowrun is basically the Matrix meets Blade Runner meets Tolkien in the not too distant future. And so it's high tech, high magic, corporate dystopian. There's, there's, it, it is a really nice mashup of like cyberpunk with magic. And I love writing in that. And Battletech uh, is big stompy mechs in space, basically. Uh, and, it's, and I grew up military, so I brought in a lot of the military factions. But in each one of those, I took the lesson I learned from Never Let Me Sleep. And I, I just started writing what I wanted to read. I, I think that's important as a writer, right? Would we read it? Would we, you know, pick yeah. up the book? I, I'm oh. just about to start the third in my uh, Shadowrun Color series, uh, Emory Gray. So on the way to Gen Con, I listened to Makeda Red. And I was like, this is actually really good. <laughs> Yeah. And those authors were like, oh, this is terrible what I've written. But I really enjoyed listening to that. So that made me happy. Well, I think that's one of the things that I try to emphasize to uh, my students and people who want to write is that write the kind of book you want to write. Write the kind of book that brings you joy, that you experience kind of flow when you're writing and you're just like, oh, I love this book. Because if you're writing because you're like, oh, I think the market's going to be really hot for wear platypus novel <laughs> next year, right? You know, and so you're going to write this wear platypus novel, but you don't really give a hoot about platypuses or plat yeah. platypi or whatever. And that just comes through. And, and you know, if you love what you're writing, uh, then the, that will, that, the reader will perceive that, I think. Well, I think the, the the reader sees that the the effort was put into it, right? The passion yeah. and purpose was behind the story. Yeah. yeah so we're ever bored writing, right? The reader's going to be bored. So when you guys are building your characters, it, does it relate to your lifestyle in some way? Your stories. Let's let's answering this delicately, since I <laughs> I kill a lot of people fictionally. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all put something of ourselves into our books, but we're all exploring different motivations, different thoughts. Um, but I don't, I don't think I model a lot on my own life. I don't well, know about you, Kat. I I think that there there's as one daydreams one ends up creating a lot of stories and so like perhaps you're like oh i had that encounter what would happen if it went this way instead um but i also draw a great deal from uh real life i mean i've got this uh, very uh fraught relationship with my mother and i cannot say how many times i have just done terrible things to her in a story and i, I remember when i had uh carpe glitter which is about a woman oh, and her wow. mother and her grandmother <laughs> uh won the nebula and my mother said well i want you to know i know the mother in the book is not drawn on me and i was like okay ma you know <laughs> I that was a great book a great novella i really liked it has anybody in your family ever read your books and said oh is that about me i haven't has you jen have you had anybody the that? thing that i get in my books um or writing is people, my, my, my family will see things that we used to say, like right. catch us, catch can, oh, no. or um, just uh, right now I'm, I'm fulfilling Dear Pen Pal, uh, Belgium 1980, which is a, a, a cozy middle grade ghost story told through physical letters. And I had my sister help me with it. And she, that one is actually built a lot on my actual life. So I guess I lied earlier. I didn't mean to. 
<laughs> but it is literally based on my life in Belgium in 1980. Um, what she remembered is things that I would say in various books, she would recognize from us growing up. So nobody is, it's nothing is based on anyone in our lives. Um, but mannerisms are, that's mm -hmm. the best way of putting it. Mannerisms and catchphrases from the family. Well, the reason that I asked that question is because I know as myself, as a writer, sometimes I can put those little tidbits in there, right? And try and see when they read the book, if they caught it or, but it's not, kind of like what you said, Jennifer, it's the mannerism, right? The pattern or the, or there's phrases that we might use and, and then they can read it and say, oh, was that when I said that, da, 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 yeah. da, da, you, you know, it brings that conversation as well. Um, and it's okay, you know, Jen, that day you came around and you're like, oh, maybe I am writing, <laughs> you know, about me. Like, But what has it always been about the science fiction for the two of you? Because you write a lot of futuristic stuff. So are you guys big believers in the future with the, with the drawer, with the, Androids and the chat G GPT and all of that. Like, how how do you guys look at that? Well, I I look at it with a great deal of hope. In fact, I, I work with a what we call hope punk, uh, which is a kind of science fiction genre uh, podcast called If This Goes On, Don't Panic. And I feel as though science fiction and fantasy. <clears throat> those stories have the the power to shape the future and so for writing stories where people cooperate and and where they don't spread hate or where they kind of like they do good stuff and we, we continue to kind of like have heroes who say yeah this is the stuff that human beings should be doing then yeah we shape we shape the future um and we when we, we shape it for the better it and it's if we let really sort of narcissistic or greedy or self-centered stories uh, take the main stage, then I, I think that creates a, a worse future. So my moniker on here is a wordslinger and optimist. And I always joke that if you're going to be a, in the publishing business, you, you're, you're a masochist or an optimist. And I have chosen joy. I do believe in the future. Uh, and if you look to the past, pretty much every generation before us, has either thought they were going to be the last generation or they have complained about the exact same things we are complaining about yeah. now. And I think eventually we will make it to the future. We will get off this planet. We will do these things because it's in our nature to do so. And honestly, I don't want to think about us not doing that. Yeah. Uh, I am 53 years old. Oh, another one of my cats has shown up. Um, I am 53 years old and both my parents died by 75. So my thought is I have 20 to 30 years left. How do I want to spend those years? How, what do I want to think about? What do I want to put out into the world? Well, I want to think about that there is going to be a legacy in the future. And so that's what I write about. It may not be perfect. The, one of the family lines is, it's not ideal, but it's not terrible. Yeah. And so that will end up in my books. Um, so, yes. As it is now, AI is not actually AI. It's not actually intelligent. It is, it is a regurgitation machine. Oh, okay. Do you want to tell me a little bit about that? So... A lot of um, artificial intelligence right now is actually pattern recognition. I used to be a QA engineer. I used to work for Microsoft. I did it for 15 years, not Microsoft 15 years. I've, I've done everything from implantable defibrillators to Epson R&D. This, this cat, by the way, for those watching, is Mina. Uh, it, right now, computers still do exactly what you tell it to do based on the rules that you tell it. There is no uh, thinking outside the box. When a computer does something you don't expect, it's because you have told it to do it. You just didn't anticipate mm -hmm. it. It's rather like as an editor, I tell authors, 
Your story is only the what's written on the page. The reader is not in your head. They don't know what you, you meant. They know what you wrote and they, they glean something from it. Right now, artificial intelligence is brilliant at finding patterns. It's brilliant at uh, mimicking things. It does not create. Yeah. And I think that is one of the main differences between uh, you know, actual sentient artificial intelligence and what we have today. Yeah. Well, that's, that's why it's somewhat deceptive when people talk about training AIs and they'll, they'll talk about, we trained AIs with this kind of wealth of all these Reddit posts or this you know, group of books or whatever. And what that is, it's not so much training as it's like making that available as stuff that the AI can chop up and rearrange in accordance to the rules. Cause it, it's basically, they're, they're a set of language rules uh, that kind of assembles uh, uh, um, yeah, it's it, it's really interesting, and I don't I don't think that we're going to see AIs writing meaningful books uh, anytime soon. But uh, I could see them writing, say, magazine copy uh, mm -hmm. or kind of all sorts of stuff further on down the line. A lot of it has to do with context, and yeah. context uh, is internalized it is nonverbal it isn't written down it is if you pick up a book that says it's science fiction you have certain expectations mm -hmm. even if you don't see those certain expectations at the beginning you you may have a a, a, a mother and a daughter sitting across the table having a conversation and it doesn't seem like it's science fiction and then Three chapters later, you realize that the mother is actually a hologram. Yeah. You know, it's it's one of those things where uh, context matters and AI doesn't do context very well. Yeah. Also, they're really good at word salad. And by good, I mean terrible. <laughs> mm. I like and that word salad. <laughs> tumultuous. That's it. That's it. <laughs> I, I want to get into your teas, guys, and I'm going right. to start with you, Kat, because I know I mispronounced the first in your first word, and I Jennifer just yeah. said it. So uh, let's talk about why you gave me those three words. So, tumultuous uh, is the T word, right? So tumultuous was the T word, and it was I think I think partially because uh, it came kind of at a time that I was sort of upending my life and rearranging things in that uh, post pandemic, I uh, got divorced very amicably and moved back here to Indiana uh, where I grew up and um, just basically decided life is too short not to be doing the things that I enjoy, which so it, it all good tumult, um, but also still kind of tumultuous. And I forget what my E was. What was my E? Excellent. Oh, excellent. Well, we all pursue excellence. And I <laughs> I think that that is uh, uh, super important. And I, I, you know, you try for excellence. You may not always achieve it, but you try for it. And your E was adapting. Adapting. I think ad that is what I'm doing all the time is adapting and learning and changing. And uh, uh, I think that is sort of crucial to aging gracefully is being willing to adapt um, as opposed to, I see a lot of my peers not adapting and being very unhappy with the world as a result. And that's too bad, I think. Well, do you think that the future is scaring the elderly? Oh, I think it's terrifying. Uh, and I, I think, you know what, I think one of the problems is, is that we don't, we have all this cool technology, but we don't think about how the aging interact with it. And so like a, a friend of mine the other day, who's older than I am, was like, I went into the Apple store and I just cried <laughs> at them until they fixed my phone. And I just, you know, and she's like, I'm old. I don't know what to do with that stuff. And um, part of me doesn't have huge amounts of, of uh, you know, part, part of me is, is, is kind of like saying, well, let's, let's not make young people think that all old people are helpless, but there is that, that just baffling 
moment where you're dealing with technology and it's clear that everybody else knows exactly what's going on but it's you know it's it's like three identical boxes and everybody's going pick the you know touch the moo moo one and you're just like i don't know which one's the moo moo one right and and there's a great uh james thurber story which is a story like his great aunt and the milking machine and there's just this moment where she sort of throws up her hand. She's trying to fix this milking machine. And she says, why doesn't somebody just take this away from me? And I've always thought it's kind of what like being old and dealing with technology is like, just why doesn't somebody just fix it? I'm sorry, I've gone off on a rant. No, that's okay. Because it, my listeners, they, they enjoy these kind of conversations, right? right. Because we're, we're there, and there's a lot, my my listening tar target audience is the older generation. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, they they want to know about this technology oh, stuff yeah. and futuristic stuff, and there are seniors that want to know more about the AI and the Chat GPT oh, yeah. and all of that stuff, right? So That's by having cool. these conversations together, Kat yeah. and and Jen, we we can get that information out there to them, you know, and they can they can feel more at ease and say, you know what, okay, I'm not the only one that feels this way. I'm not Don't the only know. one that gets overwhelmed oh, with God, it. No. Oh, no. So. And, th and that's why I love having these open conversations. And I love spilling tea because this is how we yeah. get into conversations, right? Is we give you words and then the words take us down a journey and take us down a little rabbit hole. And then we see where that takes us, right? So Jen, I wanna, Jennifer, I wanna get into your tea. And I and I mispronounced your tea as well. So techno technological is- Technology. Technology, uh, emotional and ambitious. So, so tell me why those three words. So technology, I, I existed before Google. Like I, I am from the last generation that didn't have an internet and then did. So I'm, I'm one of, the, you know, I'm a feral Gen X, latchkey kid. Uh, I straddle the generations. Uh, I remember, I still remember the very, very, very first uh, I am instant message I got. I was in college on a vax machine and I had been working on an expert system. My part of it, it was one of those group projects and I, I had the brain and everybody had, I got this message from my professor that says, I see, I see that you have worked uh, 150 hours on this project. And then your next person has worked for less than 70 hours on it. Is, you know, can you tell me what's going on? And I was just like, what? The oh hell God. is ah. this? I had no idea. And then I, 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 there was a long, long pause. And then I can't remember his name, uh, but he said, this is Professor blah, blah, blah. And then I looked and I saw the, the cursor and I typed back and I was just like, we had a conversation. That was my very, how many people can remember the very first instant message conversation they ever had in their entire life? It was well, weird. It is. Yeah. I have an email that is old enough to drink, vote, have <laughs> kids. Uh, the kids are about like 1994, yeah. I believe, is when I got my Yahoo account. I still have it. And once, okay, go back to technology. <laughs> I am slow to adopt something because I need to understand it. As a QA engineer, I can break software without even blinking. I do it very frequently. I never mean to, because I'm not in that business anymore. I just want a box that works now, but I know just enough to be dangerous. <laughs> um, but technology, when it works right, when it, 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 it helps, technology is allowing us to have this conversation now. Mm -hmm. I have been full-time uh, author and editor for over almost 18 years now. And I've been able to do that because of technology. Uh, and technology is where we're going and where we are, where we're going, where we will continue to go. And it will become more and more like magic to it's a black box that only certain people know how to work. And along with that, well, let's go to emotional. I will tell you, one of the few things that will make me lose my shit is when the computer won't do what I want it to do. <laughs> I'm guilty of that too. <laughs> I, and fortunately, my husband is very technologically advanced and I can call him and have him fix it. Um, 
but emotion actually is the touchstone of everything I do, especially in writing. All of my communications with people, I want to reach them on an emotional level. All of my writing, I want people to reach on an emotional level. Um, it's not like I'm a writer because I don't like drama. It's, it's, I like the, the different touchstones. And I think there's a great phrase that people won't remember what you did, but they'll remember how you made them feel. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So that's, that's one of the things I do with my writing yeah. is how is, how are these technological or um, physical things making someone feel? And the last thing, ambitious. Well, frankly, I am an ambitious person when it comes to my career. I shoot for the stars. I expect the moon and hope I don't hit the ground. Uh, I, I, I just won a, a, a new a scribe award for um, Shadowrun Auditions, which is the, the prequel or the, the first one to the Mosaic Run. Uh, which is my industry peers chose it as the best young adult tie-in for that year, which is brilliant. I am ambitious in that I have, I'm editing a magazine now for Shadowrun with an open call. I am ambitious that I'm going to be finishing this next anthology, Shadowrun Through the Decades, doing the Augment magazine and writing a novel. I am ambitious in... I will get to a point where I will succeed. So I live in the Seattle area. Worldcon 2025 is in the Seattle area. Currently, it's happening right now in Glasgow. So, and I will be online doing panels starting tomorrow. Uh, it's just, I, I am ambitious in what I want to get done. I have stories to tell. I have projects I want to succeed at. And I have people I want to work with. I, I love that. And I love where you took technology because it is true, right? It, it, if it wasn't for technology, we wouldn't be having this interview right now. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, and during a couple of years ago, this is how everybody communicated. Everybody oh, got yeah. online, you know, had it not been for technology, how would we have survived? How would we have pivoted our businesses and carried on? Uh, you know, I, I don't think we should be afraid of technology, but I'm like Jen Jennifer, I'm like you. When it doesn't work, I lose my shit. So <laughs> I'm just like, uh, yeah, you're not doing this to me, but I will not give up. I am very determined to jump right back on. Like you're not kicking me off. You know, like when you get booted out of a conversation or a platform, just sign back mm -hmm. on, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. show the technology that you're not giving up and that you're determined to get back on and that. Um, so, I, we got to know you guys a little bit through your teas, and I love the words because the words are words that I don't generally get. And I love when I get new words because it takes me down a new rabbit hole and a new understanding of tea, right? And for me, tea is not a beverage. It's the teaching educational awareness. It's the past, the present, and the future. And that's exactly what we're talking about is the future. You know, where is the future going to take us? And I'm, I'm like you ladies. I believe that the future is going to be bright and you know, that we will get a chance to see it. Uh, I think, you know, we might be really old. I just turned 50, <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> you know, maybe in our 80s and when I'm 80, yeah, but yeah. I do feel that we will see another planet before we, you know, move on. So I, I think it's really interesting on how much the future is moving fast, though. It could yeah. slow down a little. Because, uh, you know, uh, when you mentioned uh, your first text there, Jennifer, I was thinking of ICQ, you know, like when it used to go. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, in the dial tone where you had to get off the phone to use the Internet. So a lot of back then we didn't use the Internet as much as we do today because we had to keep the phone lines empty as well. Right. We yep. had to still have those calls coming in. So it has really changed over the years. Uh, how do you see science fiction opening doors for the future? I'll let you start with that one, Kat, because I know that oh. this one's yours. Well, I think <clears throat> I think that it, you know, that one of the things about science fiction is even though people are supposedly writing about the future, they're writing about the problems of our present day, just kind of on under another backdrop. But I I think that science fiction 
science fiction can actually kind of help make us feel more at ease with technology, I think, is, is one of the important things that it can do. It can make a lot of stuff seem less uh, scary or at least more explainable. That's what my answer would be. And you, Jennifer? Could you repeat the question? So I, I... Honestly, you know what? I spaced out. <laughs> I'm going to a different planet. I'm already traveling, ladies. <laughs> it's like, it's like, where do, okay, I'm going to ask my own question. You know, how does, how does tech writing science fiction right now help the future? Well, it gives people ideas of where our current um, society can go. Uh, technology has brought the world, made the world smaller, but it has also inspired innovation like cell phones, mm -hmm. inspired by the Star Trek communicator. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. The concept of holograms of the uh, holodeck. There's a, a new thing. Marquez uh, Brown, he's a huge YouTuber who does a lot of technological stuff, was just working with something um, in Disney. The, the Disney innovation team is frankly, amazing and terrifying. Uh -huh. uh, and they're starting to get the whole concept of holodecks and they, they're mm -hmm. getting moving tiles and such that uh, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in seeing where we're going. But at the same time, because technology allows us the world to get smaller, we're starting to see so much more, so many different other cultures their problems, which is, aren't our problems, but are becoming our problems. We are learning about new, uh, different uh, different societies based on the, si the science fiction that they write. Mm -hmm. uh, Wale Talabi, I'm, I'm now reading his uh, short story collection, Convergence Problems. Uh, he is a Nigerian writer who I believe now lives in London. He's also currently at Glasgow. He's one of my favorite writers ever. I, I adore pretty much everything I read from him. And he, he has the Saudi verse. Uh, it's S-A-U-U-T-I, Saudi verse. But it's a bunch of uh, African um, authors writing about the future. And their stuff is... It's so different. What's important? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, where America is all about the individual, the where is the the duties of the individual to society is so different in Africa and Japan. And you look at what's important to them, and you learn that through their their stories and the science fiction and fantasy stories I'm getting from Japan and Africa and um, uh, Thailand. They're opening my eyes in a different way that I did not expect, and I, I'm hungry for more. So I think science fiction and technology will help bring us all but closer together. Mm -hmm. Like families, we all fight, but and there are some bad bits to it. But I think the good outweighs the bad. Well, and it always amazes me, like that those countries, right? Japanese, Tokyo, and China, the technology advancements that they have, how how more advanced they are than uh -huh. Canada and uh -huh. the United States. Uh -huh. It blows me away. Like some of the motels that they have, some of the stores they have, uh, technology for movies, and like you said, the movies, the industry of the filmmaking. Um, I always tell people watch a Hollywood movie that it's giving you little secrets of what the future coming. You know, like when they have robot show uh, movies and that, like I Robot, I think it was with Will Smith. Yeah. yeah. You know, and then we have the the Elon Musk creating these robots and stuff, right? So we, you know, like where does he get it from? Was it from the movies? Was it? Did he know about it before the movies? Like it always interests me, right? I'm always when I watch a science fiction movie, I'm always asking questions. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody hears the movie. I think they just hear me. Like what? What did they do? <laughs> Why did they do that? <laughs> I'm usually hushed when I'm watching a movie or a show because I speak a lot. I'm just like, what? What? Where's that taking us? Like, you know. Absolutely. So for you, ladies, what is there a movie that stands out to you that? 
it helps you with your writing as well that oh i just i just watched this is my favorite movie about writing and i just uh made a friend watch it i watch it i think every few years it's called stranger than fiction and it's uh will ferrell finds out that he's a character in somebody else's book and it is just a, a delightful delightful book i think i have been told i should watch it i have never yet watched that movie they have like dustin hoffman is like this professor of narratology who like he's trying to find out what kind of narrative will ferrell is in and he starts questioning him it's, oh yeah no well it's not that it's just hysterical but yeah that that movie is is my favorite although if, if i wanted to think about comfort movies or the movies that i kind of go back to and kind of immerse myself in because i enjoy them uh there's a movie called enchanted april which is a, a kind of com like romantic comedy, and that is one of my go-tos. What about you, Jen? Um, well, inspiring my writing, I think I, The Matrix was one of those, mov those movies mm. I saw in the theater, and I did not see the big twist coming. And I, I can remember literally gasping in the theater. Um, I think one of my favorite movies about writers is Romancing the Stone. Oh yeah. Because you know, the the opening sequence where her apartment's a mess, she doesn't know what's going on, she has no tissue, you know, you get novel brain is what I call it. Um, yeah. I think is incredibly realistic. Um but I think honestly what inspires me more than movies uh well, one music does hugely inspires me, but having conversations with my peers, mm. with other people who get it, who understand what it is to write, because it's a solitary activity for a very long time. You are in your head and it has its own nuances and problems and, and mm. such. And when you sit down with another writer and you say, have you ever, here's a problem. You do some rubber ducky decoding with them, uh, which basically means they need to sit there and nod at you while you tell them the problem. And then while in the recitation of the problem, you figure out what the problem yeah. actually is. Yeah. Um, it's like a soundboard. But just being around writers, Gen Con was brilliant for this, was just, it, it refills, it fills the creative well. And it gets me going. It gets me eager to get back to work, which is good because my to-do list after Gen Con is like, <laughs> like a mile long. Oh god! But that's yeah. okay because I am an ambitious person. <laughs> and, and, and you know, uh, I can see that Jen in you. Uh, you know, get right back on the right back on the boat. Right, like as mm -hmm. soon as this this event is done, boof. Yep. And, and like you said, like at the beginning of the show, you, you've already written two, a, a novel and two more anthologies since, you know, uh, yeah. booking this appointment, uh, you know, with, to have tea time. And we did book this, uh, I think, back in November of last year. Yeah. So it has been a it, while. It's been a while. It's been yeah. a while. I had to stop and really think about, I was like, oh, because The Reinvented Detective came out in, was that November or was that January? I want to say it came out in November, but I also, uh, I, the, part of the problem of like everything in recent years is like everything slips, right? You know, like every book, we just, just like they tell you one date and just like, oh yeah, it's going to be about three months after that. And so I don't remember whether November was the original date or the slip date or, or what. It came out, oh, it says publication date was May. <laughs> May 2024. <laughs> See, this, this is why I have a website with a bibliography on it because yeah. I cannot remember. I also I'm very pleased. My I have a brand new website by a terrifyingly efficient and competent uh, web developer, and everything works. My contact form works. My new oh, no. newsletter works. I'm so thrilled. But in any case, yes, it that came out in May. But you know we. Things keep going. There, there are multiple projects going at a time in the publishing business. Well, and, and, and that just goes to show you how much has happened since then. Because it came out in May. We're, we're the next year over in August. So that's, that's a year it. and three months. So it does take a lot to go back and say, oh, 
oh, okay, what was this, you know? Uh, and that's what I mean. Some of these tea times are booked a year, a year <laughs> before, so you know? Maybe 2024, not, not, but I'm pretty sure we turned it into the publisher in November, 2023. We did, we did. So. Yeah, you're right, you're right. Yeah, because it wasn't out yet when we booked it. Yeah, when right, I, when I was so, working with Lou, so. Yeah, it's, just, just, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, I was just told that you need to have these two incredible ladies on and they have this incredible. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, okay, sure. And I always love going down the down the avenue of science fiction because I mm -hmm. do look forward to the future. You know, uh, I used to have big conversations with my grandmother who passed in November and she was 97 and she was afraid of the future. She oh. was like, I seen enough. I don't want to see any more it was scaring her. So, no. you know, and, and that's what I, that's why I went down uh, the rabbit hole and asking that question, how the seniors feel about it. You yeah. know, my listeners yeah. out there, they ask me quite often, Miss Liz, like, how do you feel about it? You know, cause a lot of people think, Oh, Miss Liz, you look like you're 20. Uh, I wish I was, my kids are older. <laughs> <laughs> my kids are in their thirties, right? My daughter's getting married in September. Like, yeah. you know, um, so, but it's just the it's just understanding that the future is coming and we can't stop it, mm -hmm. right? Just yeah. like we couldn't stop the past, we can't stop the present, and we can't stop the future. You know, we, we just have to buckle up and get ready for it and have some fun with it. Be adaptable. Yep. That's exactly. Take it, take it one step at a time because yeah, you don't have to know all the things. You just have to learn some of the things. Absolutely. And uh, that's like. I love the concept of TikTok. I'm never going to get on TikTok. <laughs> I've been on it for three years and I'm still trying to figure that thing out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, then, and there are new things and all the different ways of paying Venmo. And there's a new one called Pays. And, and I was just like, you know there's what? so I many like out there. So I like many. my PayPal. I know how to make it work. Yeah. Uh, I, so with technology, I am a slow adapter. But once I adapt to a thing, I am very loyal to that thing because I know how to use it without breaking it. Generally. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so ladies, what's your final message for our little listeners today? Wow. Um, I, wow. I would just say, say be, be nice to other people and they'll be nice back. Uh, yeah. And I think that's true in just about everything, including writing. And my, my general thing, especially in writing is, you don't have to lose for me to win. I don't have to lose for yeah. you to win. Yeah. Life is not a zero sum game. Yeah. Share the love. And, and eventually, especially in the publishing business, we're going to all work together. So we, we want to succeed in general in life. Treat people as you want to be treated. Um, and be understanding. Well, That's thank you, like Lily. You yeah. know, it, it all comes down to being kind, right? And we're all going to work together one day, yeah. whether, uh, you know, through a book, through uh, helping each other across the street, maybe one day, you know, having a cup of tea together one day, having a conversation like this one day, you know, just be kind. And, you yeah. know, yeah. we don't need competition. We we need uh, connection. Yes. I, I think we really need to focus more on the connection. And the future is about connection. It's connecting the dots and seeing where it takes us into the different universe, universe, uh, universe, and uh, different planets and all that. Because I'm curious about what kind of planet I'd like oh to. Oh my go god! On. Yes. Yeah. I'd like to. I'd like to travel the planets. Oh, you know, we so we travel the countries. Why not tra travel the planets, right, ladies? Yeah, that's it. I absolutely want to get yeah. into space someday. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I'd. Too. I'd like to go into Mars. I would like to yeah. see what they're doing up there. Oh, that'd be extremely <laughs> cool. Awesome. <laughs> So, uh, Kat, if you'd like to leave your information, I'm going to put it up one last time for your website. If you'd just like to sure. spell it out it's, for the audio listener. It's Kat Rambo, C-A-T-R-A-M-B-O dot com. And I am Kat Rambo on most social media on where I spend way too much time. And Jen, do you want to just spell out your website? Uh, it's Jennifer Brozek, J-E-N-N-I-F-E-R. B R O Z E K dot com. I am Jennifer Brozek pretty much everywhere, though I'm not the only Jennifer Brozek. There are multiple. And uh, the only other place, Instagram is Jennifer underscore Brozek, and it's mostly cats. If you want cat pictures, 
that's where you want to go. <laughs> well, thank you, ladies. It was a beautiful time together, and it, it was a pleasure having you guys here. Uh, Miss Liz will be back at 7 p.m. Eastern Center Time. And because we're talking about cats, we're going to be talking about paw prints because Kim Langling is coming in and sharing about her two new books. And one book just got released two days ago. So guess what? Miss Liz got first choice. Miss Liz got it out first time for everybody out there. So check out that tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And if you'd like to know more about Miss Liz, check out my website at www.misslizisteatime.com. And you can see all the different work that I do besides the podcasting and how we connect the dots and bring humanity back together one cup of tea at a time by serving real life stories and words. And I'll see everybody this evening for another TEA and we'll see where that takes us and what rabbit hole we go down tonight. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.